item of business, which is a statement from the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, on COVID-19. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their uh, request to speak buttons. And I call on the First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. I will shortly set out the conclusions of the Government's weekly review of the allocation of levels of protection to each local authority area. But I will start with a brief summary of the statistics today. Uh, the total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 754. Uh, that is 7.3% of all tests carried out. The total number of cases uh, stands now at 95,811. 1,021 people are currently in hospital, uh, a decrease of 20 from yesterday, and 70 people are in intensive care, uh, which is five fewer than yesterday. Uh, I regret to say, however, that in the past 24 hours, a further 34 deaths have been registered of patients who tested positive over the previous 28 days, and the total number of deaths under that measurement is now 3,759. Uh, these figures, of course, remind us that the virus is still taking a toll across the country. And again, uh, my thoughts and condolences are with everyone who has been bereaved. Um, I can confirm today, Presiding Officer, and I will do so at the outset, uh, that the Scottish Government is not pro proposing any immediate changes today to the levels that currently apply to each local authority area. Um, although, as I will outline in a moment, there are some areas that we are monitoring closely. Uh, overall, though, the latest data shows that the restrictions in place, uh, we believe, are having an impact and a positive impact. Uh, three weeks ago, in the seven days up to Friday, the 13th of November, uh, we had an average of 1,116 new cases being recorded a day. Uh, by last Friday, that had fallen to 863 new cases a day, so that's a, a reduction of more than one-fifth. Independent estimates also continue to place the R number slightly below one, and that again is indicative of a position where infections are declining. We're also now starting to see a fall in the number of people in hospital and ICU uh, with COVID. Uh, when I updated Parliament three weeks ago, uh, 1,239 people were in hospital, 102 in intensive care. Uh, today, as you've just heard me report, uh, 1,021 people are now in hospital and 70 in intensive care. So the figures there um, are coming down. Uh, and that means taking all of that into account, I can say with some confidence that we are making progress uh, and good progress at this stage. And I think it's important to stress that because I know for some people whose area has been in the same level of restrictions for some time now and you are still hearing us report high numbers of deaths and new cases each day, it can sometimes seem as though the restrictions are not working uh, and it's therefore important to stress that this is not the case. The sacrifices everyone is making are making a difference. They are getting case numbers down, reducing the numbers getting ill and needing hospital care, uh, and so protecting the NHS and saving lives. Uh, that said, uh, and I've made this point previously, the level of the virus overall, and this is particularly the case in some parts of the country, is still higher than we need it to be. There are still pressures on the health service, and any increase in rates of infection would very quickly intensify those. Um, as we go deeper into the winter period, uh, there are a number of factors that may well push transmission up again. And so we could see cases and resulting illness and death start to rise again. Uh, that means we have an interest in driving cases as low as we can now, um, and that necessitates continued caution. In summary, therefore, although we are encouraged by the impact current restrictions have had, the need to strengthen and solidify that progress means that we should take in, uh, continue to take care and err on the side of caution. So for all these reasons, uh, the Cabinet, when it discussed this earlier today, has concluded that we will not uh, propose any changes to the allocation of levels of protection this week. I'd also remind the Chamber that it is also the case that the level four restrictions in place currently in 11 local authority areas will be lifted a week on Friday, uh, the 11th of December. And so as we decide the levels each of uh, these areas will go into, we have an opportunity at next week's review uh, to look at the allocation of levels across the country more generally. And I would flag up uh, right now that it is likely, uh, therefore, that next week's review will be more substantial than today's. For now, though, I can confirm that uh, Highland, Murray, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles will remain in level one. 
uh, Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, Argyll and Butte, the borders, Dumfries and Galloway and East Lothian will remain in level two. However, I need to be clear, and I indicated this earlier on, that we have been looking and will continue to look very carefully in the days to come at both Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire. Cases in both these local authority areas have increased quite sharply in the past week by 68% in Aberdeen and 42% in Aberdeenshire. Uh, that means their case numbers, although it's important to stress that in both uh, areas, their case numbers are still below the national average, uh, are nevertheless higher than in some level three areas, for example, Angus. Uh, case positivity has also increased in both areas. However, there is a need to understand more deeply the extent to which these increases are driven by specific outbreaks that are being actively managed within, for example, food processing uh, plants and care settings versus a wider and more general increase in community transmission, which would obviously be a concern, especially as we go further into the winter period. Uh, I have therefore asked that the data for both Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire be considered in more depth over the next couple of days by the Chief Medical Officer and the National Incident Management Team um, and then discussed with both of the local authorities and the Grampian NHS Director of Public Health. Uh, given the degree of uncertainty in the information we have so far and obviously in recognition of the economic and social impact for any area of a move up to level three, we've decided to await this further analysis before reaching a firm conclusion. If this information does justify a move to level three for uh, one or both of these council areas, we will set this out uh, either at next week's review or if the situation merited it uh, earlier than that. Uh, the other level two council I want to make particular mention of today is Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, the data there is indicative of a move to level one soon. However, the concern right now in addition, of course, to general winter factors, uh, which we are considering across the country, is that Dumfries and Galloway is bordered by areas with quite significant higher levels of infection. And that is why the strong public health advice, which the Cabinet has this morning accepted, is, it is for it to remain in level two for now. Uh, if I can turn to level three, um, Angus, Clackmannanshire, Dundee, uh, City of Edinburgh, Falkirk, Fife, Inverclyde, Midlothian, in North Ayrshire and Perth and Kinross will remain in level three for now. Uh, last week, I expressed some concern about rising case numbers in Clackmannanshire and Perth and Kinross, but I'm pleased to note that numbers in both of these areas have stabilised and at this stage are improving. And finally, as I indicated previously, 11 local authority areas will remain in level four for a further week. These are Glasgow City, East and Western Bartonshire, Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire, North and South Lanarkshire, East and South Ayrshire, Stirling and West Lothian. We will confirm next week the levels that these areas will move into when level four restrictions end on the 11th of December. Uh, Presiding officer, there are just three further points I want to briefly update on today. Uh, firstly, I want to highlight uh, changes uh, we announced yesterday and will make from next Monday to eligibility for self-isolation support grants. Uh, they mean, uh, these changes mean that potentially eligible individuals no longer have to be receiving universal credit to claim the payment if their local authority believes that they would qualify uh, for universal credit if they applied. In addition, the grants are now available for people on low incomes who have to stay at home while their children are self-isolating and who would otherwise lose out as a result of that. Ensuring that people self-isolate is an essential part of tackling the virus, so the extension of support payments is an important way in which we can help more people to do the right thing. Uh, the second point is to report briefly on the continued expansion of uh, the testing programme. The mass testing of students uh, has started successfully and all students who are planning to return home for Christmas are advised to take two lateral flow tests a few days apart and many uh, students have already done that and, and many more booked in uh, for these tests. In addition, testing is now available for people without symptoms of COVID in several communities across the country which have had a high prevalence of the virus. For example, test sites opened yesterday in Dalmarnock and Pollock Shields in Glasgow, in Stewarton in East Ayrshire and in Girvan in South Ayrshire. Another site opens tomorrow in Johnson in Renfrewshire. 
These trials are important for their own sake, but they are also important because they will inform our plans to expand community testing early in the new year. Uh, and we do hope that will be a useful additional tool in reducing prevalence of the virus in areas with high rates of transmission. Uh, and finally, Presiding Officer, I want to reiterate today that subject, of course, to regulatory decisions, we remain very hopeful that uh, even before Christmas, we will be in a position to start vaccinating people in Scotland against COVID. Uh, the Cabinet reviewed uh, this morning the plans for vaccination, and I can confirm that we are ready to begin that process just as soon as we receive the first supplies of vaccine. And of course, we hope that by the spring, a significant proportion of people who are most vulnerable to COVID will have been vaccinated. Uh, vaccination over time will help us all to return to a more normal pattern of life. Uh, and of course, that means that a possible route out of the pandemic for Scotland is now in sight. So we have all the more reason to uh, keep uh, ourselves and each other safe as we head towards, we hope, that end point. Sticking to the rules, uh, perhaps now more than ever, continues to be the way in which we can do that. So I would ask for continued compliance in the weeks ahead. Uh, outside of the three island authorities, none of us should be meeting in each other's homes. Meetings outdoors or in public indoor places should stay within the limits of six people from two households. Uh, and I would ask everyone to continue to abide by the really important travel restrictions. If you live in a level three or four area, do not leave your local authority area unless for an essential purpose. And if you live elsewhere, don't travel into a level three or level four area. And please avoid non-essential travel between Scotland and other parts of the UK. Uh, and finally, everybody should remember facts, the rules that help keep us all safe in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, wear face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean uh, your hands and hard surfaces, keep two metres distance and self-isolate and get tested if you have symptoms. If we all stick to these rules, uh, then the progress I have been able to report today, I hope we will continue to see in the uh, days and weeks to come, which uh, will pave the way for uh, more parts of the country coming down into lower levels of restrictions in future. Thank you very much, First Minister. First Minister, will that questions? Come the news that Tier 4 restrictions will be lifted across 11 local authorities on Friday the 11th of December and encourage people in those areas to stick by the rules for the remaining time. Whether in Tier 4, 3, 2 or 1, having restrictions on how you live, work and see your loved ones has been difficult for us all this year. And I recognise the effort and forbearance it is taking for people to keep going and I thank them for those efforts. But the question I'd like to ask the First Minister today is regarding schools and the Christmas holidays. We've just heard the Cabinet Secretary asked what parents and teachers can or should expect this year with incomplete and insufficient information having to be dragged out of John Swinney in return. We have said repeatedly over the weeks and months of this pandemic that people need relevant information in good time in order to plan for their own lives. Now there are parents in council areas across Scotland who are expecting their children to be in school until the 23rd of December and there are others who are expecting them to return to class on the 5th of January. Yet three days ago, they awoke to press reports that there could be a nationwide breakup on the 18th of December and no return to lessons until the 11th of January. And for three days, we've had no confirmation for government and today, no statement in parliament. We're already in December and workers with children need to tell their employers what is going on. So can the First Minister confirm, will there be a standardised nationwide school holiday this Christmas? When will her government make a statement to Parliament to confirm for thousands of families out there what is going on? And what provision is being put in place for the children of key workers during this period who could be faced with a childcare crisis in little over a fortnight's time? First Minister. Uh, we will confirm uh, the conclusions of our deliberations uh, as soon as we have concluded them and uh, the Deputy First Minister or I will set out to Parliament uh, what those conclusions are. Um, we are deliberately thinking very hard about all of these issues. They are not straightforward. There are arguments for uh, standardising the holidays and perhaps extending the holidays slightly. There are also good arguments against that. And those decisions have to be carefully considered. And of course, they have to be driven by uh, the latest evidence. And that is what we will do. I would hope that we would uh, set out our conclusions on that uh, sometime over the course of this week to give parents uh, due notice. And uh, we will take these decisions carefully, uh, given uh, the factors at play. Uh, everything we are doing right now 
uh, acting in a way to try to help contain and suppress the virus, causes difficulties and harms in other ways. That's the nature of the decision making uh, that is underway, not just here, but across the UK and much of the world right now. That's why we are deliberately taking these decisions carefully and we will communicate them uh, in uh, just as, as soon a, a time as we can. Uh, it's also why uh, we have taken the approach each and uh, every day almost of this pandemic of updating the public uh, as we go and we will continue uh, to do that. It's not so long ago of course that the Conservatives wanted to take away our ability to do that on a daily basis uh, but we will continue to do that and we will give uh, the Parliament the notification of that as soon as we have come to uh, the decision driven by the data that we monitor on a daily basis. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, £500 is a welcome gesture for the hard work of those key workers on the front line in health and social care. But for those key workers who have been working on the front line of other parts of the public sector, and for those in the private sector like shop workers, it will be of little comfort. In fact, whilst I'm sure that shop workers would like a bonus this Christmas, what they need is some reassurance that they will have a job in the new year. With the collapse of two huge retailers in the last 24 hours and the real and devastating threat now posed to many retail jobs and suppliers, what assessment has the government made of the impact of Tier 4 restrictions on the retail sector? And will the Scottish Government now finally get round to establishing the Retail Recovery Group that has been promising to set up for months to try and save what is left of our high streets? First Minister. Um, firstly, on the uh, £500 thank you payment to NHS and care workers, uh, let me take the opportunity again today to say thank you to all of these workers. No payment, <laughs> no payment can ever properly express our gratitude, but it is a, a small but important uh, way of doing that. Uh, all sorts of workers in all sorts of different uh, professions, occupations and sectors have gone above and beyond the call of duty in uh, the last uh, nine months, um, and they will have my uh, deep and everlasting gratitude for that. But I think we all recognise, it's why we stood in our doorsteps uh, for week after week earlier in the year, applauding health and care workers, uh, that the particular contribution uh, of that workforce is uh, I think uh, worthy of particular recognition. It's only a matter of weeks, I, I think, uh, if my memory is serving me correctly here, that Richard Leonard at First Minister's Questions challenged me to do more to say thank you to NHS and care workers. But of course, as soon as we do, he decides that that is not enough and he's going to uh, ask for uh, something else. Uh, but uh, we will uh, continue to do, in the face of uh, public sector pay freezes being announced by the UK government, we will continue to do everything we can uh, to ensure proper reward and recognition, uh, not just for NHS uh, and care workers, but workers across the public sector who have contributed uh, so much. Um, in terms of uh, retail and the impact of all of these restrictions, we assess uh, all of these things carefully through the, the four harms analysis that we do. Uh, but the reality here is, and these are decisions that certainly in this part of the chamber cannot be avoided. Uh, unfortunately, government can't abstain on these decisions the way I understand uh, Labour are doing in another part of the, the UK today. We have to take decisions that suppress this virus to the extent that we can pave the way for the sustainable opening up of the economy. Because if we allow the virus to run out of control, the impact on the economy will be longer lasting and much deeper than it would otherwise otherwise be and whether it's retail uh, and uh, obviously we intend to lift the level four restrictions uh, on the 11th of December uh, and we'll set out this time next week uh, what the, the levels are that these areas will go into after uh, the level four ones come to an end and we will continue to work with sectors including retail uh, on recovery as we uh, move into the next phase start to vaccinate people and hopefully get quickly back to a position where the economy uh, starts to trade and operate some, uh, on a basis much much closer to normality than it is right now. And Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for advance sight of the statement. The slow rate of improvement uh, in infections over the last few weeks reinforces my concern that reducing the restrictions at the end of next week and reducing them further over Christmas may mean that a sharp increase in January becomes inevitable. I would like to ask the First Minister, though, about compliance with Level 4. I've heard uh, from about the situation of constituents 
who are working for an employer whose core business is deemed essential, being in food supply, but they are being expected to go out to work, not doing deliveries, but doing marketing, door to door, uh, up and down tenement stairs, drumming up sales, not delivering food. Does the First Minister agree with me that this kind of work, particularly given the extension of the furlough scheme, employers should be deeply cautious about sending people out door to door, generating unnecessary social interactions, purely in order to drum up sales? Does the First Minister agree with me that this type of activity should not be deemed essential and employers should think again? First Minister. I would agree with that in general terms, but in the absence of detail about which companies and precisely what is, is uh, Patrick Harvey is talking about there, I'll, I'll uh, avoid uh, going into to specifics. I'd be very happy to get more detail of that so we uh, could consider it further. I get lots of emails and other contacts with uh, su suggestions that uh, some companies and individuals are not complying uh, with the letter or the spirit where it is appropriate we follow that up. I think in general terms, compliance with restrictions, whether in level four or any of the other levels, is good and strong. And uh, where we can, we gather data on that. Uh, you know, for example, in terms of uh, transport and travel, obviously the police uh, gather data on uh, any penalties uh, that they are issuing. So I think the evidence is uh, that compliance is good, but there will always be exceptions to that. I think the vast majority of employers are operating responsibly, but again, there will be exceptions to that. And I would urge all employers uh, to behave responsibly towards their workforce and to uh, stay within both the letter and the spirit of these restrictions. Because while it is hard now, and I recognise that, uh, it is in the medium to long term uh, benefit of employers for all of us collect collectively to get the, the levels and the rates of infection down. Uh, but in uh, agreeing with Patrick Harvey on the generality, uh, I'll end by saying I would be very happy to look at some of the detail of that and if there's more uh, we can do or more comments that it would be appropriate for me to make I'd be happy to do so. Willie Rennie. Um, people are doing what is expected of them which is why we're seeing uh, the indicators improving in many parts of the country but 10 days after cases started to increase in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire the First Minister still can't tell us whether this is because of isolated outbreaks or community transmission. This was the problem when we had rises in the virus in Fife and Tayside, but the situation doesn't seem to have improved. When is the tracing system going to be able to tell us what is going on? And secondly, last week I asked about visits to care homes for families. With the virus in the decline in many parts of the country, when are families going to be allowed to see their loved ones in advance of Christmas? First Minister. Uh, well, on the uh, data, I mean, so I and Cabinet colleagues have uh, looked at uh, very detailed data on both Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire over uh, today and the last uh, number of days. And the reason we can do that is because Test and Protect and the tracing is working well. We wouldn't have that information otherwise. Uh, but what we need to understand more is whether uh, those cases, which uh, we do believe are associated largely with some outbreaks and uh, members are aware of the, the particular, some of the particular outbreaks that, that we are talking about, food processing, for example. Uh, but we have to have a, a degree of certainty that they can be contained and haven't uh, resulted in wider community transmission. And given the, the economic and social implications of a move up a level, I have asked uh, that a bit more work is, is done on that. But if you look at uh, Fife and Angus, uh, areas where uh, we moved, uh, that were moved up a level some weeks ago, the situation there is improving. This is a difficult virus to contain, but uh, cases are coming down. They are coming down uh, largely because of the compliance of the public with the restrictions, uh, but also because of the very good work that Test and Protect and our public health teams are doing, and uh, they will continue uh, to do that. Um, on care homes, the Health Secretary has set out the, the guidance on care homes. Uh, local uh, public health directors working with care homes are trying to normalise as far as possible uh, care home visiting, while continuing uh, to keep uh, safe those within care homes and uh, the, the measures, further measures that the Health Secretary set out last week to extend testing uh, to designated visitors of care homes will help uh, with the process of that as well. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Jamie Green. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, with regards to the Scottish Government measures to help people uh, in uh, to, to maintain self-isolation, 
Can the First Minister set out what the proposed changes to the uh, Scottish Government support are and how she believes that this will facilitate um, further compliance with the self-isolation rules and therefore help to stem the spread of the virus? Thank you. First Minister. Well, right now the grant uh, is for low-income workers who are in receipt of universal credit or other benefits and where they will lose earnings uh, as a result of having to self-isolate. Uh, so the two uh, particular extensions, I think, will help more people. Uh, firstly, uh, you don't, uh, will not, no longer have to be in receipt of universal credit if the assessment of the local authority says that if you did apply for universal credit, you would be likely to get it. So that will extend the number of uh, people on low incomes uh, who will be eligible for receipt of the grant. But the other, and, and in some ways, uh, perhaps even more important extension, is to recognise that for some people on low incomes who will uh, have to stop working for a period if their children uh, are asked to self-isolate in order to provide uh, childcare for their children. Right now, because they, the adult is not the person having to self-isolate, they are not eligible for the grant. So in, uh, from uh, Monday, they will be eligible for the grant if their child is having to self-isolate. So again, that will extend quite considerably the reach of the support payment. And in doing that, I think it will make it easier uh, for people to do something that is inherently very difficult, which is to self-isolate for such a lengthy period. And we will continue to look for opportunities uh, to strengthen the support we're giving people so that we can continue to improve compliance with what is uh, one of, if not the most important restriction that we're asking people to abide by right now. Jamie Green to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you. The First Minister will know that Renfrewshire has been under heightened restrictions since uh, September the 14th. And many businesses complied with the government's own guidelines, but saw their trade limited, their doors shut completely, and sadly, some may never reopen. Two months in, it still has the highest weekly infection rate in Scotland, double the national average, and is reducing at half the rate. Something clearly is not working. And people rightly will ask why months of lockdown are still not reaping benefits. So can I ask the First Minister, quite frankly, what is not working and what has been done about it? First Minister. Well, Renfrewshire has been uh, one of these areas that has uh, remained at stubbornly high levels, which is why it was put into level four, and level four will continue until the 11th of December. But if I look at the seven day, uh, last seven days uh, of uh, data, uh, and this is the data we will publish today, case numbers in Renfrewshire are actually down 16%, uh, which is bang on uh, the national average. Uh, test positivity is down over uh, the seven day period by 1.2%. Uh, the national average decline in test positivity is 0.5%. So we are starting to see signs of that reduction in Renfrewshire, which uh, will be in large part due to the level four restrictions kicking in. Uh, but it's also because we want to try to accelerate that, that one of the uh, mass testing pilots that I spoke about earlier on uh, is in uh, Renfrewshire, uh, and we will look at uh, extending that further. But I, I do think we are starting to see uh, signs for some cautious optimism uh, that Renfrewshire, uh, like other parts of the central belt, are starting to turn the corner. Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Can the uh, First Minister clarify if any consideration has been given to flexibility around the dates of relaxed restrictions for NHS staff and other key workers who are required to work over the stated five-day Christmas period? First Minister. Well, we recognise that uh, the relaxation of restrictions to allow families and friends to come together, uh, if it is absolutely necessary, is necessarily limited. Uh, the guidelines uh, set out what we think is proportionate and a careful approach uh, to rules around socialising. Uh, we cannot ignore that any relaxation of measures carries additional risk, uh, and so the temporary easing is about helping uh, those people, uh, particularly those uh, who might otherwise be on their own at Christmas. We've considered the impact of these changes on those working through the festive break as well as uh, key workers but reluctantly we will not uh, be able to extend that period any further for any particular groups uh, and we appreciate that many people will not be able to celebrate Christmas in their usual way uh, but we believe that we've put forward a sensible position uh, that will help us through this period hopefully on the way to greater normality as a result of the vaccination that will begin soon. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Fulton McGregor. 
In July 2020, the First Minister said that Scotland did not have a problem with COVID deaths in care homes. Deaths from care homes are not included in the daily figures. The numbers um, at about two weeks ago stood at 2,240 deaths, some 42% of the total from COVID so far. That's more than 10% higher than in England, and the trend is unfortunately increasing, with more than five times as many deaths now than there were a month ago. So there is a need to work faster than is proposed. Families will be visiting loved ones in care homes at Christmas, so will the First Minister ensure that there is rapid, even daily testing for staff, residents and families in all care homes over Christmas to keep everybody safe? First Minister. Um, okay, firstly, um, I, I genuinely think uh, Jackie Bailey misunderstands the basis of the daily figures that we report on deaths. Uh, the daily figures uh, include anybody uh, who uh, has a registered death where they tested positive within the previous 28 days, regardless of, of the setting uh, in which they, uh, they died. Um, and the wider NRS figures uh, include uh, cases of people who have died uh, where the uh, relationship to COVID is presumed not confirmed through a test. So it's not true uh, to say that care home deaths are not included um, in the, the daily figures. Secondly, I have never said that we don't have a problem with care home deaths. Uh, what I have challenged, and I'll come on to uh, demonstrate that, is that there is a, a particularly severe problem in Scotland relative to other parts of the UK. I have recognised and will recognise uh, forever uh, that we have have had a problem with care home deaths and I, I, I don't think it is fair to suggest that I uh, have said anything other than that. Uh, the point I have challenged is the point that Jackie Bailey has made that somehow the level of uh, care home deaths in Scotland from Covid are significantly higher than in other parts of the UK and, and England in particular and I think you see uh, the reason why I challenge that uh, and let me say that the number is, is too high and not suggesting otherwise but the reason I challenge that is that when you look at uh, the figures and these are figures drawn from National Records of Scotland for Scotland and ONS for England and Wales uh, excess deaths in care homes in England have been higher than in Scotland in Scotland, a greater proportion of them have been attributed to COVID. Now, it's for other people to say what the excess deaths in England not attributed to COVID uh, have been caused by, but it strikes me that perhaps one of the reasons for the, the differential in figures is that we are uh, attributing more of these deaths, uh, and perhaps accurately, to uh, COVID. In terms of testing in care homes, the Health Secretary has set out the plans for that, and we will uh, take these plans uh, forward um, in a proper consistency considered way and uh, it is because we are so concerned with any potential for deaths to start to rise in care homes again that we are being cautious uh, about things like visiting which is difficult for families but is part of that important balance that we have to seek to strike. Thank you. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, I've been contacted by a number of taxi drivers in my constituency who have been severely impacted by the very necessary restrictions, particularly those on the nighttime economy. I know that discretionary funding announced last week was very welcome news for many and a glimmer of hope at the end of this difficult year. Can I therefore ask what plans the Scottish Government have to distribute this discretionary funding and what further supports can be provided to self-employed taxi drivers affected by the pandemic? First Minister. Uh, well, I think we all appreciate, and the government certainly appreciates, the devastating impact that restrictions have had on the taxi and private vehicle hire sector. Um, on the 17th of November, we did announce an additional £30 million in business support funding, and that is being provided through the local authority discretionary fund, uh, and it is for uh, local authorities to distribute that money. And I said specifically uh, that taxis uh, and, of course, others in uh, wider supply chains uh, should uh, be recipients uh, of that support. Uh, we've also made further funding available through the COVID uh, Public Transport Mitigation Fund uh, to support installation of equipment that reduces the risk of COVID transmission on public transport and that includes taxi and private hire operators and in addition to this we're also considering support for fixed cost pressures on taxi drivers and others uh, which will be distinct from the new Strategic Framework uh, Business Fund. Edward Mountain to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, on the 10th of November, you allowed up to six people from two households on Shetland, Orkney and the Western Isles to meet. This was due to a lack of meeting places and the need to address isolation. Given that the Highlands and Murray have the same issues, 
and have the same level on the allocator of levels table, both on the 24th of November and today, will you consider mirroring, mirroring the island's home visit rules to the rest of the Highlands and Murray? Uh, yes, we are considering that. The uh, advice uh, to date has been uh, on a precautionary basis not to make uh, that change. Uh, however, it's one of the issues we will be considering uh, up to and through next week's review. And if there's any change to that next week, I will set that out to Parliament. Martha, to be followed by Liz Smith. Tomorrow, a new asymptomatic testing centre will open in Johnstontown Hall and will I live in Johnston, I don't have any symptoms, but I will definitely be along to get tested. Will the First Minister join me in encouraging other residents in Johnston, as well as those who work here, to head along to the Town Hall and get tested? Uh, yeah, I would very much encourage people in Johnston uh, to go along uh, to the testing centre and take advantage of the opportunity to be tested. Uh, one of the sites in Glasgow uh, is in my own constituency in Pollock Shields, and I uh, have uh, and will continue to encourage people there as well to get tested. I think the, the benefits of this are twofold, obviously, for individuals who go along uh, to get tested, even though they don't have symptoms. If they uh, do happen to have COVID, uh, then that will be detected, and uh, they can then uh, be given the advice to isolate. But it also, the more people that uh, take up this opportunity, it allows us uh, to test the operation of this system, and that will inform our planning for the greater rollout of mass testing early in the new year. So I hope people in Johnson uh, do take up this opportunity for their own good, but also for the collective good too. Ms Smith, followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you. The First Minister will be very aware of the concerns that were expressed in the most recent uh, Scottish Attitudes survey that the Scottish Government's efforts to curb the spread of COVID-19 may have been hampered by the public's weak understanding of the facts message. Given the approach of the Christmas bubble arrangements and the need for full public trust in and uh, confidence with the health message, what action is the Scottish Government taking to improve the clarity of that COVID messaging? First Minister. Uh, our own uh, polling shows uh, that actually there is a good understanding of these key messages, but we're not complacent on any uh, of these issues. Uh, those who have been, uh, which I'm sure doesn't include that many people in the chamber, uh, had the opportunity to watch television in recent days will have seen a new advert uh, on the facts campaign, which... Uh, Maybe I would say this, but I think it's very good and it actually does set out uh, very clearly uh, the uh, steps that we're asking people to take. So we keep uh, all of these things under review so that there is as wide uh, and as good as possible a public understanding, not just of what we are asking people to do, but why we're asking them to do it and the benefits it brings to them and to others. Gillian Martin, to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The majority of my constituents have followed the guidance to keep the spread of virus under control. I see it in the communities I represent. It's disappointing to learn that Aberdeenshire has seen an increase in case numbers and test positivity rates. And the fact that Aberdeenshire remains for the moment in Tier 2 shows decisions are not straightforward as a general increase in numbers as we have particular concentrated clusters of infection. Can the First Minister outline what work the government is currently doing with Aberdeenshire Council to avoid having to impose more restrictions? First Minister. I think the first thing it's important for me to reiterate, and I know Gillian Martin would agree with this, is that it's not the fault of anybody uh, when uh, cases are, are rising in a particular area. This is an infectious virus. I think we all know what we can individually and collectively do to try to keep it under control, but uh, I don't think we should look at different prevalent rates in different areas and conclude that's because some people are trying harder to uh, stick uh, with the restrictions uh, than people in other areas. But Gillian Martin raises uh, good questions about the role of local government in our decision making. Uh, local government is represented at the National Incident Management Team and also at the Four Harms Group. Uh, COSLA and SOLACE attend as observers at both of those forums uh, and these meetings include discussions to identify emerging risks across different parts of the country um, and as, uh, as highlighted by the, the suite of indicators we use and other research and that also includes consideration of different means and methods to more proactively manage these. Uh, the Deputy First Minister spoke to Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire Councils yesterday and we will have detailed discussions with them this week about COVID rates in their communities. Um, and lastly, all local authority chief executives receive um, the daily updates of the indicators uh, produced by Scottish Government analytical officials uh, at the same time as they are sent to directors of public health. And this is the same information uh, that ministers will look at on a daily basis as well. Mark Griffin, to be followed by Ruth McGuire. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, answers to written questions show that NHS Lanarkshire received the lowest flu vaccine allocation compared to its over 65 population on the Scottish mainland, and I was inundated with complaints about appointments. Can the First Minister assure people in Lanarkshire that there will be a fair share of COVID vaccines um, allocated to the Health Board? Everyone who needs it will get it, and it will be handled in a better way than the flu vaccine was. First Minister. Um, yes, is the short answer to all of that. I am happy to look into the particular point about Lanarkshire. We, we, we allocate uh, the flu vaccine supplies on a, a fair basis based on um, the estimates that uh, health boards will give uh, for, for the needs and the uptake in, in different eligibility groups. So there's no, there's no unfairness in the system in terms of how we allocate that. But if, if there has been a particular issue in Lanarkshire that I'm not aware of, I'm happy to look at that. And I'm sure that the Health Secretary will as well. Health Secretary has made uh, a statement uh, to Parliament already about the plan for uh, rollout of the COVID vaccination programme. As I think I said earlier on, she updated Cabinet. Cabinet reviewed the plans this morning. Uh, this is a, a complex logistical exercise, more so than flu, uh, partly because of some of the, the conditions, the, the storage conditions, the temperature at which some of these vaccines have to be uh, stored uh, and dealt with, and also the fact that it is likely, I think, for all of the vaccines we are expecting to have right now, that people will need two doses uh, three weeks or thereabouts apart. So it's a, a complex exercise, but the planning is underway and is in uh, a good state, and we are ready to start vaccinating people just as soon as vaccines are licensed and we start to get these supplies through, which we are very, very hopeful uh, may be uh, in the next couple of weeks. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Presiding officer, many um, workers do jobs that they cannot do from home. Can I ask the First Minister to set out what resources are available to and what responsibility employers have to support employees who are advised to self-isolate but unable to work from home, please? Yes, um, we would expect uh, employers to be very uh, sensitive and very responsible, and I've got no reason to believe that the majority are not being. So where somebody can uh, work from home, it is really important uh, that they are supported to do that. But where somebody cannot work from home, what is really important is if they've been told to self-isolate, uh, they are not put under pressure to come into work. It is important that they isolate, uh, and where companies can continue to support them uh, financially, uh, they should do that. That, but one of the reasons, of course, why we have uh, put in place the self-isolation support grant is to take account of uh, circumstances in which that will not be possible, particularly for those on low incomes. But um, I want to take the opportunity to thank businesses across the country. This is an incredibly difficult time for them, and the vast majority are working hard, I know, to support their employees as far as they possibly can. Mike Rumbles, to be followed by George Adam. Um, does the First Minister accept that she could ask a full parliament to agree to major changes in COVID regulations before they come into effect, rather than always asking for approval after they come into effect, sometimes up to 28 days after they come into effect. I just contrast this with what is actually happening at Westminster right at this moment, where MPs are debating and voting on their major changes in regulations before they come into effect. First Minister. Um, when we put uh, areas into level four last time, par Parliament did vote before uh, the changes took effect, if my memory is serving me correctly. Um, I, I have made very clear, uh, and I'm looking to the presiding officer here because he is probably as uh, more aware of uh, where these discussions are uh, right now than I am. I have no, uh, all I care about right now is that we do what is necessary to try to control the virus. I, I absolutely have no objection to Parliament being as involved as upfront and as early as possible, uh, as long as that does not hinder any of us in trying to do what is necessary. So I am open to any uh, discussions uh, or ideas that come forward as to how we facilitate that better. We're not proposing any changes uh, this week, uh, but if that uh, is different, and it may well be different next week uh, as areas come out of level four, um, I'm certainly very open to trying to maximise parliamentary scrutiny and consent uh, as far as possible. George Adams, followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government has had with local authorities like Renfrewshire Council about the mechanisms of coming out of Level 4 in a way that is responsible and does not see a rise in COVID-19 cases? 
First Minister. Well, it's a really important point. We will uh, be having uh, discussions with uh, all of the councils that uh, will come out of level four, both about the level they go into and about the precautions they should all be working uh, to take with health boards and others in their areas to prevent a, a rise in infection. And we've had these discussions with uh, East Lothian as it came down a level uh, last week. Um, and the, the reason that's an important point is, is because it's always really vital to remember that for any area going down a level is not a new neutral uh, act. Uh, going down a level means more opening up of the economy and society and that gives more opportunities for the virus to spread. So unless uh, mitigating steps are taken, the danger is that we start to see transmission rise to the point where we have to consider going up a level again. So these discussions with uh, Renfrewshire and with other local authorities will be very important in trying to collectively avoid that happening. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Graeme Simpson. First Minister, when will guidance be published to ensure that small businesses don't miss out on the new funds that have been announced? What publicity will there be to help them find out whether they're eligible? When will those funds be available for distribution? And what support will be available to assist local authorities in processing these funds? First Minister. Uh, when we announced uh, the uh, additional funding, when uh, we announced the Level 4 um, areas uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was also uh, an allocation given to local authorities to help with the administrative costs of uh, processing the grants. Uh, and we'll continue to discuss with local authorities the costs um, to them associated with that. Uh, the grant scheme is already uh, open for applications and people can find out on their uh, local council uh, website how to do that and we will continue to take steps to raise awareness and where appropriate there is a, a whole suite of guidance on almost every uh, issue under the sun right now for people uh, almost perhaps too much guidance for people to to look at but we will continue to look at where we need to issue more guidance to help people navigate their way through a very complex situation and graham Sims. thank you tier four restrictions will be lifted at 6 p.m on december the 11th I've had representations from businesses asking if they could be allowed a full day's trading that day. So is that something the First Minister would consider? And can she also tell us if the travel restrictions will be lifted that day? And if not, then when? First Minister. Um, on the 6 a.m., 6 p.m., we have uh, decided that just as these restrictions came into force at 6 p.m., they should be lifted at 6 p.m. on Friday the 11th. And uh, while, of course, I will always uh, agree to consider anything that I'm asked to agree, I don't want to raise expectations that we're going to change that position. Um, on uh, the uh, point about travel restrictions, I will. We will be considering travel restrictions as we consider uh, the uh, review for next week and what level different councils go into when they come out of level four. I can't say what that decision is right now because we haven't taken it yet, but I will set that out next week. We will keep travel uh, restrictions in place for no longer than we think is necessary, uh, but for as long as we think is necessary to, to sustain a proportionate tiered approach to these restrictions because as I keep saying if we don't have uh, travel restrictions in place when necessary the danger is we move the virus from area to area and then what becomes uh, of greater risk is that we have to have nationwide restrictions in place so these are really important issues to think through carefully and get as right as we can. Thank you very much colleagues. Um, oh, yes point of order Mike Rumbles. Um, I would hate to think that the First Minister has inadvertently misled Parliament, but I think in her answer to me, correct me if I'm wrong, she said that she believed that Parliament had the debate and vote on Tier 4 regulations before. The, as far as I am aware, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, that the Parliament has only had a debate and vote on uh, a motion that was non-binding. In fact, before that vote started, before that debate started, you actually mentioned that in the Chamber. Could you just make sure, could we... Could I ask for your help in making sure that the facts are accurately recorded in the official report? Thank you, uh, Mr. Rumbles. Yes, it is the case that uh, we had a vote on the motion which was non-binding, and I specifically said it wasn't a vote on the regulations. Uh, these matters are a matter for, uh, I think the, the First Minister has made the point, these are matters for the Bureau and uh, business managers to consider. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next item of business, uh, and we'll just have a short pause while we change seats. Remind members to observe social distancing, wear masks when they're leaving their seats, leaving the chamber and following the one-way systems, please.